Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. Uh, I hope everyone here is doing great and hope you and your families are safe. Uh, my name is Colin Barry-Brisbois and I'm the head of technology at Seed Electronic Arts. Uh, and in this keynote today, I will chat about the dream that many of us have had for so many years where ray tracing is the future and will ever be. Uh, this time with a focus on video games. Um, I will discuss the state of the art and various challenges we're facing in games with real-time ray tracing. So hopefully my talk will give you a sense of where we are at uh, in the games industry with some of these challenges uh, that we're facing, but also uh, inspire you uh, for your future research in case you want it to make its way uh, into video games and other real-time interactive mediums. Before I begin, I would like to thank Ulf and Ari for inviting me and I would like to thank Peter Pike and Paul for their great keynotes. So here's the agenda for today's talk. So first, I will give a quick overview of SEED's research. Uh, I will then spend a few minutes looking at where we're at uh, today with real-time ray tracing in games. Uh, then I'll talk about the road ahead and what are some of the things to consider when thinking about uh, ray tracing research and making it applicable for games. Uh, finally, I will talk about some of the open problems that remain. Hopefully this should uh, spawn some ideas uh, in your head that you can bring up during the Q&A uh, right after the talk. So let me tell you a bit about SEED. So SEED stands for Search for Extraordinary Experiences Division. Um, in case you don't know who SEED is, we are a technical and creative uh, research division of Electronic Arts Studios. We were established in 2015, and our team is around uh, 30 people and is distributed uh, across the world in six locations, including Stockholm, Montreal, Los Angeles, uh, Redwood Shores, London, and Vancouver. You can find more info about Seed at seed.ea.com, uh, or you can follow us on Twitter. Um, and at EA, uh, SEED exists as a cross-disciplinary team where we combine art, engineering, uh, creativity and research to deliver uh, d disruptive innovation for our games and our players. So we try to run as fast as possible towards the future uh, and we run in parallel to current business constraints. And this is for the benefit of our games and all of EA Studios. So by focusing on short, medium and long term research, our portfolio gives us uh, an opportunity to do research and always be delivering technology artifacts along the way. Um, we do this in collaboration with game teams, central groups, as well as many external partners in hardware, software, uh, industry standards bodies, and academia. And of course, as an R&D group, we have to present and publish. Uh, and over the years, we've accumulated more than 50 publications and presentations, uh, which you can find on our website. Uh, we also open source some of our work, so uh, you can find it uh, and you can find us on GitHub as well. At SEED, our research is split in three vectors, so advanced avatars, deep testing, and future graphics. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of each vector so that you get a better idea uh, about these topics that we're focused on. So advanced avatars, uh, the first vector I want to bring up, is based around building a revolutionary pipeline for creating emotionally convincing characters. And so at SEED and EA, we are deeply focused on transforming how we do performance capture for our games. Uh, we do this by using machine learning and computer vision to build these artist-friendly assisted workflows that um, enable content creation at scale and quality. So this means that uh, character creation technology for accelerating the work of our art experts so that they can do their best work and iterate as fast as possible uh, to really focus on the art. Our second vector is deep testing and is a direct application of machine learning for improving how we test games. It is uh, you know, well known that games are getting bigger and bigger and that with games running as live service, gamers want more content delivered faster. And this is where machine learning comes in and enables us to improve how we test these games at scale and speed so that we can deliver better content faster and hopefully bug free. Uh, so instead of you know, taking a brute force approach and just throwing more people at the problem. We use machine learning to build tools that help our testers with um, tedious tasks, which means, uh, you know, an overall improvement of quality of life for their, for them, for our developers, uh, where they can actually focus on more important fundamental things. Um, also, 
you know, the progress of neural networks learning how to play games by themselves. We can mimic human-like behaviors that really go beyond uh, current automated testing approaches. So for example, like scripted bots where, you know, where the game will actually learn and play like a human. So this means that we can find bugs faster in ways that humans do, you know, before they get out in the wild uh, to millions of players. And finally, our last research vector, Future Graphics, is built around uh, building novel content creation techniques and breakthrough visuals. You know, real-time ray tracing obviously comes to mind, but also other things like real-time global illumination, uh, realistic physics simulations at a fraction of the cost, uh, and new ways of authoring content. So uh, more, more on this at upcoming conferences. Uh, so here we try to push the boundaries of real-time visuals and simulations, and we try to enable uh, building and playing in worlds that you know we could only dream of before. And the thing is, as programmers, we tend to want to optimize, which means uh, sometimes coming up with approaches that are not always friendly for content creators. So for example, having to build LODs or having to unwrap UVs is one of those uh, tedious tasks that you know that comes to mind. And so in this vector, we explore radical shifts in how we build the content uh, with a focus on making these new approaches artist-friendly and pain-free. We also explore how these techniques can benefit some of the latest hardware. So with, you know, next generation consoles, well, I guess you could say current generation consoles now, but also future hardware architectures. So now that you know a bit more about Seed and what we do at EA, let's switch gears and talk about uh, real-time ray tracing in games. Looking back, this journey of bringing real-time ray tracing to life has been quite awesome. You know, from the initial announcement of DirectX ray tracing back in 2018, where you know a few of us partnered with Microsoft, NVIDIA uh, to bridge the API, the GPU, and the software, and also some of the great work from our friends at Epic, uh, FutureMark, and Remedy to uh, hardware acceleration being announced and an initial round of PC blockbusters supporting ray tracing in real time like Battlefield 5. You know, this was a really a really good start to 2018. Then in 2019, people had a bit more time, you know, to play with the API and and it evolved and with all the conversations between Microsoft and the companies listed there and the developers which led to, you know, the spec for DirectX ray tracing to evolve to version 1.1. Uh, and then following that, in 2020, uh, a new generation of consoles got announced with ray tracing support, which, you know, really helped solidify and reinforce the fact that real-time ray tracing is happening across consumer entertainment platforms. And then in 2020, beyond DirectX, the Vulkan API ray tracing spec got finalized by the committee and the various members from industry and, you know, people that are in this in this talk right now. So. So looking back at these four original demos, you know, at Seed, we felt very lucky to have been involved early on with Microsoft and NVIDIA to see what could be done with this technology. Speaking for ourselves, you know, the hybrid rendering pipeline we built for our Pika Pika demo at the top left uh, really allowed us to create visuals that, you know, are augmented with ray tracing and feature an almost path trace quality at 2.5 uh, samples per pixel. Um, you know, this was really challenging to build, but extremely fun too. And, you know, you can also forget the the amazing demos from the folks at Epic, NVIDIA, and ILM uh, who built uh, it in the Star Wars universe with uh, film-like features and visuals in Unreal 4. And there was also this really cool demo from our Finnish friends at Remedy, you know, featuring a bunch of ray tracing techniques in their North Light engine, including reflections, ambient occlusion, indirect lighting, and ray trace shadows. Uh, similarly, another great demo from the folks at FutureMark who always come up with really impressive showcases to push your GPU as far as it can. And as mentioned, you know, DICE's Battlefield 5 was one of the first games that shipped with real-time hybrid ray tracing using the XR uh, powered by EA's Frostbite engine. Uh, you know, it features really awesome uh, ray trace reflections. And now you know, beyond the initial round of games, a myriad of games followed suit and showcase ray tracing. Uh, I counted 50, not, I don't think, I couldn't list them all here, but you know, the list keeps growing. And this is really encouraging to see. And it's totally understandable why everyone is excited about what real-time ray tracing can enable. Let's talk a bit about the two most common techniques these games support. 
starting with reflections, which undeniably add a lot to the image. Um, obviously, one can do perfect mirror reflections, though the more complex case here is to tackle rough and smooth surfaces. This is typically done in a hybrid way for performance reasons by figuring out which pixels on screen can rely on screen space reflections results first. So if the ray coming from the camera uh, into the scene and its reflection end up on screen, like the puddle of water here from Battlefield 5 with the results highlighted in orange, then you can use existing screen information for that reflection. So otherwise, you trace the ray uh, in the world and evaluate the BRDF at the hit uh, here in blue, for example. Results are then merged and technically should blend and match, but this all depends on maybe some of the shortcuts you've taken along the way in your BRDF evaluation. Hopefully they fit well together. Uh, as you probably guess, this approach is taken mainly for performance reasons. Uh, other tricks to achieve performance are needed on top of that. So things like variable rate uh, tracing, where you evaluate um, where you should launch more or less rays on the screen, for example. Ray binning, where you launch reflection rays pre-sorted by direction buckets to help drive the GPU with more predictable intersection workloads and shading workloads for that matter too. Um, you can even sample the shadow maps instead of launching a secondary ray for the reflection shadows. Um, as you can see, like many tricks here and from the image uh, below, this is a glimpse of the whole pipeline that was built to have real-time reflections at performance in Battlefield 5. So please check out the talk from Ioannis and Jan on this topic for even more details on the whole pipeline. And Shadows is another popular real-time ray tracing technique that you could find in all these games, mainly for its simplicity between quotes. Um, here I say between quotes because at its core, uh, it's not too complicated to implement, right? Just launch a ray from the surface towards the light, and if the and if it hits something, then you're in shadow. Uh, alternatively, if it misses, then it means you're not in shadow. And you know, say, oh, well, hard shadows are great, but you know, soft shadows are definitely better at conveying scale and are more representative of what happens in the real world. Though maybe our direction, you know, is fine and wants hard shadows too, with minimal penumbra. Um, so the simple case of a directional sunlight can be implemented by sampling random directions in a cone towards the light and treating it like an area light. But the thing is, the wider the cone angle, the softer the shadows, so the more noise you'll get, and so you'll have to filter and denoise it. Uh, you can launch more than one ray if you want, but you will still, it will still require some filtering. As you probably guessed, the complex case here is area lights, where you need to sample across the area, uh, so here you definitely need denoising, but you'll get really nice, uh, so, like soft shadows, like the images, uh, like the image on the right here from Call of Duty. Really awesome blend of sharp and rough shadows, as you'd expect uh, from real-world lights. Now that we've talked about the state of real-time ray tracing in games, I would like to talk about some aspects of the road ahead for real-time ray tracing from the angle of research. So to be more precise, hopefully some items mentioned in these next slides should give you some insight into what we think about as game developers when it comes to ray tracing for our games and, and some of these challenges, right? So, and how this could potentially drive and tailor some of your research in case, you know, like I said at the beginning, you want to target games or any other real-time mediums. So one thing about game development ray tracing and film ray tracing is that production ray tracing solutions don't always map one-to-one -to, -one to game ray tracing solutions. Uh, for film, you will find many courses at SIGGRAPH, you know, on production rendering with a focus on path tracing, where we talk about complex shading, handling millions of lights, uh, difficult volume rendering scenarios, and, you know, other things you can think of uh, for film. Um, you know, really difficult use, use cases that render in 24 hours, render times, you know, on massive clusters. Now, the thing is, in games, uh, we have a much more limited set of ray tracing features in order to fit in 33 or 16 milliseconds. Um, still, ways, the, still ways to go before, you know, we move to full patch tracing in games uh, like film, but I think we'll get there some way. So the first thing uh, is that most of the work we do is tailored around maximizing the hardware uh, that we have, right? So whether that's on PC or consoles. A common denominator to achieve that performance with these techniques is that they are built on this concept of a hybrid pipeline where 
different aspects of rendering are solved with the best tool at hand. So for example, you might use rasterization for some of the rendering. You know, rasterization is very good at what it does and GPUs do it very well. So we should definitely use it uh, to its full potential. You know, compute shaders as well, you know, and the programmability, programmability that they unlock, you know, for some of the aspects of the pipeline. Uh, some techniques might also mix and match various stages and, and that's okay. And that's, you know, what's needed to achieve that performance. So this hybrid world I'm talking about here, you know, from the example uh, on this slide, to me is, I, I think it's here to stay at least for the next few years. Now, I think the elephant in the room is that as we go through this transition and add more ray tracing to our games, at its core, ray tracing can diverge to how we currently think of rendering in games. So in games, you know, what you look at is often what is assumed to require processing. But with ray tracing, many systems need to be adapted where uh, everything is expected to be available and provided up front. So rays, you know, can end up anywhere in the scene, right? So, you know, materials need to be known up front and rays can also hit objects that are really far. So you need to handle various levels of detail for geometry and textures. So maybe things you don't typically have loaded and resident in memory have to be. Um, animations is another one that comes to mind of which uh, I'll cover in the next few slides. So the first one that comes to mind is how you handle world state. Um, and as I was saying in games, what you look at is often what is assumed and so you don't render or even load things you don't see, which sounds pretty obvious. But with ray tracing now, you can't really rely on rendering workload reduction uh, mechanisms like frustum culling because rays are launched in world space, meaning they can go behind or outside the frustum or outside the, you know, outside the camera. And just loading everything and updating everything is not really a solution uh, for performance. And it's actually quite prohibitive to constantly update acceleration structures. This means that you need to handle dynamic things like animations and dynamic geometry to the best of your ability, predict what needs updating and cleverly do so to manage that performance. Uh, here's an example where in this game, you can notice that some of the characters in the reflection are in uh, what we call T-pose, meaning that they are in a default state and are not being animated. And their position in the world is right. So, you know, the characters are where they're supposed to be, but the animation was not updated. So some of the other characters, though, look like they're walking and in animation. So, you know, it's clearly driven by what is being budgeted per frame for updating animations. Uh, one can only guess here that some sort of round robin prioritization happened. And you can also notice that some objects are also lower resolution in terms of shading. Um, again, most likely for performance reasons of not having everything loaded at highest quality and being able to update every dynamic object, every frame here, you know, for a big chunk of the game world that can be uh, reflected in that window. You know, this is an open world game. And if we talk about numbers, here's what I mean. So when I mentioned that updating a BVH uh, is not free, um, you know, as you know, a BVH is a structure that we use for accelerating ray tracing and ray traversal in the scene. Uh, the latest generation GPUs accelerate this by providing hardware ray triangle and ray box intersection. Um, and this is supported by a two layer structure. So top and bottom. So in Battlefield 5, the example here is 20,000 top level instances and uh, 5,000 bottom level meshes. Uh, a naive update of the whole BVH then is 60 milliseconds. Uh, so instead of updating the whole thing, you know, by cleverly balancing rebuilds and refits, uh, you can bring this down to 1.15 milliseconds per frame while slightly augmenting the cost of your trace. So you can see from the numbers here going from 0.7 to 0.8. You know, this means that the BVH is not perfect every frame, but you're significantly reduce the cost uh, without affecting tracing too much. Uh, streaming is another case that comes to mind that needs to be adjusted for ray tracing. Uh, again, rays can you know, go in any direction. And this well-used concept of uh, positional loading prioritized by camera orientation kind of goes out the window. Um, but ultimately, this means that more resources need to stay resident at high resolution so that visuals and the transitions between the zones are coherent. 
Um, lights is another one, right? So how to handle lights is, is, is something that comes to mind. So here again, you can't only treat lights that are intersecting or enclosed in the frustum. So how do you choose which lights to sample when a ray hits a surface, any surface? Uh, to solve this, you can use a camera-oriented acceleration structure like what Unity does. Uh, you can also use a horizontal plane with per cell light list, like was mentioned in Battlefield. Uh, but another approach is to treat this as an important sampling problem with some really great papers by Moro and Yuxel, uh, and lately the spatial temporal reservoir resampling paper from NVIDIA and Bitterly that shows how reservoir sampling can accelerate conversions for both biased and unbiased use cases you can see from the images there and handle millions of lights in milliseconds so this is really promising another item here is material graphs game engines uh, heavily rely on artist driven material graphs where a lot of the features assume uh, concepts easily available for rasterization but not necessarily for ray tracing so Things like procedural geometry, like vertex displacement or instance vertex animation in a, done in a shader, you know, affects the geometry ultimately uh, in the blast. So it will require refits and rebuilds. And a refit and a rebuild is not something, you know, a shader can typically trigger. Uh, transparency, where a mask, for example, is used to clip as another example. And, you know, that concept is much more complex to implement with ray tracing, you know, with any hit shaders, uh, which requires additional shader invocation, which ultimately can affect performance. Or pixel quad derivatives, uh, you know, to choose which MIP level to pick when sampling a texture. There is no pixel quad for ray tracing, and so you'll have to implement something on your own, whether that's ray differentials, ray cones, or the latest paper from Akin and Muller on uh, improved shader and texture level of detail using ray cones. So three years in now into real-time ray tracing, and now that APIs are moving towards being able to launch rays from any shader stage, a trend is to move towards more decoupled ray tracing. Here's a high-level example of a generalized pipeline where large out-of-core ray batches and ray hits are sorted for deferred sharing and shading. Basically, grouping work items together that make sense to optimize GPU workloads, occupancy, and overall performance. So basically six stages that can be adapted based on your needs. So the first step in a compute shader is to build a list of rays that you need for uh, ray tracing. Here, because this is general, you can think of launching rays in screen space and texture space or any other parameterization of your choice. You can also do this at any resolution. Then you bin the rays to maximize coherency. Uh, one way to do this is to sort rays in some kind of space that allows you to bucket them by direction. It turns out that octahedral space is perfect for this. Um, but bidding can go beyond directions, like ray types that you know will do similar work, but direction is definitely a common way to do this. Then in a ray gen shader, so for each bin you launch the rays. This is to manage uh, coherency, again, which is key for performance. So grouping things together that perform similar operations and memory accesses like uh, primary rays or shadow rays or reflection rays, things like that. Then back to a compute shader where hits are gathered and sorted by material ID, for example. Uh, you don't shade just yet, but instead sort all the unsorted hits into something more organized and regrouped. Um, GPUs like predictable workloads and shading random materials from random rays doesn't really align here. Uh, this is why this stage is really important. And so by batching similar things, the overall GPU occupancy will be uh, later improved. And this next stage uh, is where the hits are shaded. Again, in a compute shader where basically uh, the shader runs based on each hit type to shade. Um, by grouping common work items together, like materials of a certain type, again, you're helping the GPU here. And this is also where you might launch secondary rays for things like reflections or shadows or global illumination, for example. And those would enqueue back into the ray generation stage. Uh, finally, the last stage is where the, the final result is put together. Uh, you might also handle reconstruction at different resolutions. You might uh, reuse results. You might merge uh, you know, results with non-ray tracing uh, effects and 
of, of course the devil's in the details uh, especially when it comes to reusing and merging results at different rates and different resolutions to reduce var variance. But overall, this should give you a good idea of a general decoupled pipeline for real-time ray tracing in games. Now for the last section of this talk, let's discuss open problems. So fun things to think about and maybe you can help solve. So there's a myriad of general real-time ray tracing open problems, whether from the scheduling side, whether that's instruction cache and occupancy and you know data cache coherence or things like just-in-time blast construction. This great paper by uh, Lee on traversal shaders to build the entire acceleration structure when necessary, but also decoupling. So you know talking about like reusing intermediate results across paths and frames to noise right so optimal mis to reduce variance and the whole thing from end to end like pre-filtering sampling and denoising and so some of these are definitely you know worth looking at and still still uh, important to solve so here's a more specific open problem so in this world of hybrid pipelines we see more and more implementations of custom geometry renders so the amazing strand-based hair uh, that the Frostbite team has presented and shipped uh, with the eSports FIFA team is a good example of a very optimized compute-based software rasterizer. Um, and with ray tracing now, the software rasterizer has to interface and feed into the ray tracing acceleration structure. So that's a bit of a challenge. Also recently, Unreal 5's uh, micropolygon geometry render Nanite is bringing super high levels of detail to real time where basically pixel is the new triangle. So this means that constant streaming of geometry detail uh, and in the world of ray tracing, as we saw, it can greatly affect performance and of acceleration structures, right? And so how do we handle these new trends? The next open problem is around challenges of a two level hierarchy. Let's take the example of a tree blowing in the wind. Um, you can implement this with a two-level hierarchy where in the top level lives all the trees, so the, the forest really, and the bottom is the actual tree, which needs rebuilds over time as it animates in the wind. Uh, this leads to increased pressure of rebuilding the bottom level as the leaves animate, which is expensive and a lot of unique geometry. Alternatively, with a three-level hierarchy here, where you split the forest, the tree, and the branches, and narrow down and reduce how much rebuilds and refits you need, I'm sure you can think of other examples where another level of indirection could really help. And so what's the saying again? Like all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. Another interesting problem is lenses and mirrors. So because of reflections and refractions, it's now very difficult to predict uh, where a ray will end up in the scene and the impacts on LODs and streaming. So for example, a ray could end up reflecting or refracting into an unpredictable area of the scene. And considering that uh, ray tracing expects things to be known up front, this can be an issue. Not necessarily a crash, but more adverse effects like things popping in, especially over a few frames or stuff not being visually uh, coherent. And so users can notice this and this can greatly affect the overall experience. Lastly, mesh shaders and ray tracing. So the concept of mesh shaders is a new exciting concept that simplifies a traditional rendering pipeline with its vertex, tessellation, and geometry shader stages and replaces it with two stages, right? So the task shaders and the mesh shaders. Uh, the challenge here between mesh shaders and ray tracing is the fact that arbitrary data packets or meshlets can expand into an arbitrary set of primitives. And so in the case of building games with both mesh shaders and ray tracing and trying to keep things coherent, a hit shader that arbitrarily hits a meshlet would then have to invoke a task or mesh shader, which means a non-trivial expansion for ray testing. Uh, compared to the hardware support for Ray Triangle and Ray ABB. It sounds like quite the performance challenge, and so maybe there is a need for such an expansion to dynamically feed into the BVH Builder uh, for performance reasons. So some things to think about here. So in summary, real-time ray tracing adoption in games has significantly moved forward since 2018. You know, for the many games that have adopted ray tracing on PC, but also the games on consoles too. Still, we have many challenges to solve. Uh, but we're in this together, academia and industry, so let's find ways uh, to work on this together. Check the annex section of this deck for extra slides with uh, some code examples.
I would like to thank the following uh, individuals who are part of making this talk happen. And of course, check out our website, c.ea.com, and follow us on Twitter, at c. Here are the references for this talk. Merci. Thank you.